Okay. I'll have the call for the sediment, please, Lynn. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Members, if you hear your name, could you confirm your attendance, please? Councillor Maitland, here. Provost Todd. Councillor Freel. I'm here, Lynn, thank Councillor Cowan. Here. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. Present, Lynn. Councillor Barton. Yep, yep. Councillor Holland. Here, yeah, thanks. Councillor Lennox. All in here. Councillor Crawford. Yeah. Councillor Watts. I'm present then. Councillor Filson. Here. Yeah. Councillor Hogg. That's me. Here. Yeah, thank you. And Councillor Stewart. I'm here, Lynn. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. And just call for any declarations of interest. None. OK, just proceed. Thank you. And I think we're going to go through the hearing procedure. Just for clarification. Thank you, Chair. The hearing will begin with the head of sorry, the Chief Governance Officer or his representative providing an overview of the application. The objectors will then present their objections to the committee and members will have the opportunity to ask questions on the submissions made. Members, please note this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. The applicant and all the agent will then address the committee in support of the application. And again, members have the opportunity to ask questions on the submissions made. Members, again, please note that this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. At this stage, the hearing will then close. Officers present will give appropriate clarification on matters which have been raised during the hearing and members will then move to determination. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. And um, our first piece of business this morning is agenda item number four. This is the planning application number 22 oblique 0262 oblique PP. And this is application for planning permission for erection of three um, dwellings with detached garages as associated infrastructure, including change of use from agricultural land to residential stroke domestic use, garden and recreation ground at Perclown Mill. And that's over to Vary. Thank you very much. Oh, it's just one second. One's coming back. Um, apologies to you, Chair, just to confirm that agenda item number three has actually been withdrawn from today's agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, just before I go on to the recommendations, so I'll give a summary of the site and the surrounds. Um, and before I do that, uh, I just want to point out there is a small error at page 80 in the last paragraph which is in bold, it states that the development does not accord with policy raise five, when in fact it should be raise one that's stated there rather than raise five. So I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, okay, so this shows the location of the application site. Uh, in this case, it's located approximately 1.5 kilometres northwest of Hollybush, which is down here, and roughly two kilometres northeast of Dalrymple, which is down here. It's accessed via an unclassified road which links the A713 with the B742. So the A713 runs here and the B742 is runs along here with the uh, South Ayrshire boundary. The site is located south of Plurkluan Mill to agricultural land. You can see again the application site outlined in red here, uh, the A713 here and the B742 here. I hope you can see my cursor okay, uh, just the left hand side of the site. Uh, the proposal is to erect three large detached dwelling houses to the south of the unclassified road uh, and the Perclown Mill cluster. The proposed houses would be located around a private access and such drainage area, which is located here. So this is the access area and the suds area and the three plots that you can see here. Uh, 
the application site is noted as extending to the larger field boundaries. So you can see the red line of the site that extends to the field, whereas the plot boundaries are dashed in blue. Um, it's not it's not totally clear why the boundaries were drawn to include all of this area, um, but should members wish to uh, approve the application, a uh, condition would be applied, which would be to prevent this area from the, the use of this area being changed to domestic ground uh, so that it isn't becoming part of the cartilage of the plots um, and would remain as a field, which we think would be appropriate. Um, I'll just note as well that the, the U-shaped uh, footprints of the houses, um, they are all the same, all the same footprint and all the same design. Uh, and in Perclune Mill, um, it has quite a distinctive layout, which is based on the mill buildings and farm. So here is the original mill building, Perclune Mill. Adjacent to that is a, another converted building, uh, the farmhouse to the left-hand side of that. Uh, and adjoining outbuildings. Um, Perclune House is a new house built on the footprint of a agricultural building and it's the same with Perclune Cottage, but we'll have photos of that shortly as well. Uh, this is a larger scale plan and a bit more of a detailed plan. Um, you can see here the layout of the plots and the houses and the driveways to the front, which is quite a large area of hard standing, and particularly with this plot three here. Um, there is a proposal to plant additional trees, which would um, supplement the existing woodland to the, the south east of the site. Um, and you can see that there is also an access track that's proposed into the remainder of the field here. Uh, the plans don't show the site levels, but this will be shown in photographs. Um, taking levels information from the, the flood risk information that was submitted, it shows that the ground floor levels of the houses would be some two to three metres higher than the road level and the level of the houses in Perclue and Mill. It's also likely that retaining features and other underbuilding features will be required to accommodate the, the large uh, footprints of those houses, uh, taking account of the gradient. As noted within the report, all of the houses are of the same design. Um, so you can see here, this is the frontage of the houses. Um, the, it's quite a lot going on in the frontage with the two gables and in the central gable porch area. Um, the materials proposed are um, timber and render walls, uh, natural stone and a slate roof. And the, that's, this is the rear elevation to the top and the side elevation to the bottom. Um, and just to show the uh, layout of the floor plans, this is the ground floor plan. And the first floor plan. And uh, this is just the detached garage that's shown with every plot. Uh, this is just an extract from the LDP. Um, the site is within the rural diversification area. Uh, this is a Google Street View photo, which is actually from 2009, just about the time where the Perclue and Mill uh, uh, development was, was going on. Um, so this is the house on the left-hand side is Perclune House, which is a new house, um, and that was built on the footprint of an existing agricultural shed. Uh, and Perclune Cottage is similar as well, that is a, a new build. And looking from the other direction, um, you can see to the right hand side the original mill which was converted and an adjoining building which is a, a separate converted house and the farm buildings, farmhouse and buildings uh, to the left hand side of the mill which were also converted and uh, refurbished. Uh, so this is looking into the site from the road up towards the woodland, and you can see some of the the gradient of this the the site at this this location. And panning round to the right, um, again noting the the gradient. And again to the right, uh, there's a hawthorn hedge which bounds the site with the the road at present. 
and this is looking along the road. That the application site is in the right hand side. Uh, you can see the Hawthorne Hedge, and uh, this is a stable building, which is to the left. Um, there is a proposal to lower this hedge to one metre within the visibility display areas. And this is looking the other way, a uh, Perclue Mill on the right hand side. You can see that the vegetation has matured quite a lot since 2009 when the development was happening. So it's, it's a fairly well screened development now. And again, another view, uh, Perclue, this is Perclue Cottage, I think, to the right hand side. And the application site on the right, um, sorry, the application site on the left. So, as explained within the report, a uh, Perclune Mill is considered to be a cluster which would accord with policy res 5 due to it being a clearly defined group of six houses and therefore a suitably therefore a suitably sited and designed addition of up to three houses may be acceptable in principle. However, as noted at page 84 onwards, the application for three houses is recommended for refusal on the grounds of its unacceptable siting and design. This is primarily due to the proposed houses being out of scale and out of character with the existing Perclure Mill development. The existing Perclure Mill has a distinctive character with tightly knit buildings organically sited within a discrete location. The proposed houses would, in contrast, be uniformly designed and sited with large footprints and large plots, which would be dominated to a large extent by the parking hard standings to the front. This would be exacerbated by the difference in levels, with the finished floor levels being some two to three metres higher than the existing buildings. Uh, and this would have the effect of the houses over dominating Perclune Mill rather than fitting into it. This is all considered to be contrary to NPF 4 policies 14 and 29 and LDP policies OP1 and RAISE 1 and supplementary guidance of the, on the design of housing in the countryside. The recommendation does take account of the representations, consultations and other material considerations. 19 representations were received and those are summarised and addressed at page 39 onwards. Just noting some of the concerns about the flood risk and surface water issues, uh, the development is considered to avoid the risk of flooding from the Perclune burn due to its siting and surface water both from the field and from plots is showing as being attenuated within the suds area with an outfall to the burn. The Council's flood risk officer has no objections on this basis. Um, issues of existing surface water runoff are not relevant to this proposal, but it can be expected that the proposed drainage would address this. In summary, it is recommended that the committee refuse the application for the reasons cited within the report. Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. We now move on to the hearing procedure. And um, our first person up to speak is Mrs. Melissa Donald. And we're going to allow five minutes, Melissa, OK? And five minutes, Greta, I think you're next. And then 10 minutes for the applicant. So thank you. And we'll be quite gentle with the five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to explain our reasoning for being against this proposal for planning permission. And really many thanks for providing such a thorough report. I have lived at this design winning Perclune Mill development with my family since March 2008, and we were the first house to move in. Its appeal was the peaceful location in, in rural Ayrshire without the isolation that some rural properties experience, and we really appreciate that. It is a beautiful cluster of six houses, each unique in its design, but with the commonalities of the stonework and oak structures. It is compact without being on top of each other, using the space available sensibly, as often results from repurposing an old farmsteading. We are lucky to have the Perclune burn running through our development, and since the building work stopped, we're privileged to see so much wildlife 24-7. And I note that the RSPB have not been consulted on this proposed development, and also wonder if the impact of light pollution has been considered on the wildlife. The proposed development is on a greenfield site and very spread out. 
nor is the design in keeping with what is already there. Being greenfield and the size of the proposed buildings will take away valuable biodiversity, upset the habitat of the current wildlife incumbents, and also remove significant grass for carbon capture that is currently working for us every day or year long. There would be significant number of conditions needed to rectify these issues alone. Over the last 15 years, I have run and walked thousands of miles up and down that single track road that this proposed development is on and have experienced many close shaves on my personal safety. I seldom wear headphones, never the noise cancelling ones, as you have to be on constant alert for traffic with the blind bends, no passing places, no pavement and ever quieter cars. But I still go up and down several times a day, be it with my two border terriers, who are always on a lead, or more recently pushing a buggy with one of my granddaughters in it. And it won't be long before they're walking with me, but they won't be able to mindlessly skip along. I wouldn't let a child walk a pet dog up and down that road unaccompanied e either. It's just not safe. You don't have many seconds from hearing a vehicle to getting onto the grass verge, and that's assuming you're concentrating and not daydreaming, as many people do. And the state of the road is another issue, affected by the traffic and the water that comes down the hill very regularly, since we do live in the very well-recognised wet west. East Ayrshire Council and Scottish Government are rightly passionate about people's mental and physical well-being. And we know that walking outside is a major benefit to both. But where is the logic in making people drive away from the countryside to walk somewhere safer? Because they will need to drive everywhere. There is no public transport available from the Pecluan development. This development would significantly increase the traffic on this unclassified road to unacceptable levels, such that it would take out any enjoyment there that still is just walking out your door to walk in the countryside safely. I ask you, the councillors, to ask yourselves if you would put your near and dear ones at risk in walking. And I ask you, would you intentionally move there, knowing you'd be increasing your carbon footprint as you need a car? for every single trip. So please refuse this development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, Greta? Oh, sorry. Sorry, any questions? Too. Forgot, any questions from the members? Thank you. Did anybody have any questions? Very quiet. I'm on my either, too. You're fine, Melissa. Thank you very much. Greta, if you'd like to come forward. Good morning. Even if you haven't managed to visit Percluan, you will see that it's set in a very peaceful rural location, somewhat remote from services, transport, shops and schools. Percluan Mill community forms a tight cluster. It has an impressive history from the 14th century onwards, but pre-Roman too, traces of the Roman road, later the mill and the laid, burns connections too. It's a blue network around there, the water attracting otters, king, fisher, fish, insects and bats flows from Martinham and Loch, two miles beyond the A713 to the northeast, along a wildlife corridor from that wildlife site. Local residents object in principle to this development with unacceptable sighting, size, appearance, with physical impacts from developing a sloping field accessed from a narrow country road. Firstly, the size of development. The application site is marked in red uh, and is shown on the maps, as you've seen, and, and it's shown at the end of your planning report. It extends over the entire field, which is twice as large as the Percluan cluster on the other side of the narrow public road. The planners accept, C57, page, section 57, that the application site is too large and suggests that if approved, a planning condition could be attached to regulate development. No defensible boundary is shown, and the current local development plan's guidance on expansion of clusters is such that further development could leapfrog sporadically along this field. 
This guidance is to be revised, but it and the rural housing policies are being challenged in the current local planning uh, development plan to examination. Two, siting and sloping field above the mill cluster bears no relation to this established historic grouping, which is a clear sense of space, clear sense of place as well. Res 5 rural housing prefers infill in a cluster. The rural design guide marks this type of development with a cross. You've probably seen the document. Um, tick for good, cross for unacceptable. And it's described in that as being suburban, uniform and anywhere design developed in isolation around a cul-de-sac. This development is not related to the Percluan cluster, but separate uphill on the opposite side of the road. The planning report before you quotes National Planning Framework Policies 13 and 14, accessibility, sustainable transport, inappropriate siting and design are quoted. Res 5 and existing council guidance reflect this too. In particular, local development plan overarching policy OP1 design guidance. Um, uh, in this report, along with Res 1, is, is stated as non this application stated as non compliance and repeated in the comprehensive reasons for refusal. Sustainability is becoming increasingly relevant in rural areas. When, within villages there, the services near there need support. Greenhouse emissions must need to be reduced, not increased by extra commuting from the hinterland in order to use them. In this report on page 58, Access and Sustainability, it says, the site is unlikely to be deemed accessible, that there is tension between policies citing new housing in the countryside as per the Local Development Plan and National Planning Framework. The residents agree as development on a site, a site sloping down to a high flood risk area is unlikely to aid their accessibility on a narrow winding road, still with water problems. You have an, a long, extremely comprehensive report before you, which recommends a refusal if you were to consider approval. It lists several issues which re could require additional planning conditions. To conclude, I will simply list a few of the planners' damning observations on this proposal. Percluan is a cluster, but with challenging opportunities, as it has already nucleated that new development would dominate and is out of context with the mill group's distinct historic identity and I detract from it. A modern overscale incursion with a uniformity of layout and design which is alien to the area, a manufactured and overscaled incongruous incursion into this jewel of a beautiful area. Please refuse this development. Mm. Thank you very much, Greta. Five minutes. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? No, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite the agent, Donna Kennedy, if you'd like to come forward, please. And Donna, you have 10 minutes. Having reviewed the report, it is understood that the application has been recommended for refusal by the planning department, mainly based on their opinion that the design does not comply with policy. Other points relating to drainage, flooding and road safety have all been addressed within the report by the case officer and we note there are no issues relating to any of the above. Any issues can be addressed in conditions, which is fairly common and fairly standard in a lot of planning applications. Biodiversity is also mentioned within the report, but it states that there is sufficient space within the proposed development site to support and enhance biodiversity in the area, and the report confirms that this can be conditioned if approved. Within the report, it is noted that the application does not comply with four relevant policies within NPF4 and the current local development plan. All of the reasons for refusal are relating to the design of the site and the design of the house types. I would firstly like to address the site layout. 
The proposed layout has been directly inspired by the existing development at Berkloon Mill. The proposed houses are asymmetrical courtyard designs and they have been positioned in an L-shape arrangement to face onto the proposed Soakaway Pond. This creates an area of open space in front of the new houses and is similar to Berkloon Mill where you access the development and the houses either face onto a widened section of Perclune Burn or they look onto the existing reed bed. The majority of the existing houses sit back from the road, with the exception of one, and there is a lot of open space around the existing development. The proposed development has been designed to mirror these aspects. The existing development also has two access points from the public road, another aspect that is replicated in the proposal. From my experience, Ayrshire Roads Alliance prefer individual properties to be accessed from a secondary road rather than directly from a public road in the interests of road safety. Visibility and road safety will be improved by the development. The site layout has been designed to take this into consideration and a through road with two access points is a rural solution that improves road safety in line with Ayrshire Roads Alliance guidance. As a result, the proposed dwellings are set back from the public road, which as previously mentioned is replicated from the existing development. One of the most recent additions to Perclune Mill is an agricultural shed located adjacent to the public road. It is the closest building to the development. The layout addresses the position of the shed and is a natural extension of the existing development. The site layout is inspired by the existing layout of Perclun Mill for the reasons mentioned, and it cannot be said that the layout is not in keeping with the character of the area. It is in keeping with the character of the existing cluster we are extending. We also need to consider the house type design in relation to the, exi the existing dwellings within Perclun Mill. Firstly, the scale of the proposed houses is similar to the existing houses at Perclun Mill. The frontage of the proposed house is 21 metres. This dimension has been directly influenced by the scale of the existing houses at Perclune Mill. Perclune House has a frontage of 20.9 metres, the original farmhouse has a frontage of 20 metres and the frontage of Willow House is wider, it is 22.9 metres. There is very little difference between the frontage of the proposed dwellings of the, ex the proposed, excuse me, there is very little difference between the frontage of the proposed dwellings and the frontage of the existing dwellings. A drawing which hasn't been shown, um, which I submitted, L14, shows the four different um, footprints of the houses. And it is very difficult when looking at that drawing to identify which one is the proposed house and what three are existing. Almost all of the houses at Perclune Mill are over one and a half storey. Perclune Cottage, which is closest to the development site, is one and three quarter. Otter's View is one and three quarter. And the original mill building is the dominant building within the development that is two storey. We do, we do accept the proposed footprint of the new houses is bigger than the existing dwellings at Perclune Mill. But the frontage of the new dwellings is the same as some of the existing houses. And this was a key design decision. Since the design of the conversions in 2007, the requirements of homes have changed for a number of reasons. Additional equipment is required within properties to house renewable energy systems. And also the pandemic has brought a new way of living and working with a significant number of people now working from home and people are more aware of their physical and mental health. The new dwellings have been designed to suit the changes to lifestyle, environment and regulations that we are all adapting to. It is noted within the report that the development may appear over-dominant. The backdrop of Potters and Woods, the topography and the rising levels beyond the houses ensure they will sit within the landscape, well below the horizon line, and as a result, they will not over-dominate the area. The visibility of the dwellings will be reduced further by tree planting to the front. As shown, this is a technique used within the existing development and eventually will ensure the proposal is partially concealed within its environment. The design of the houses themselves reflect the material finishes and form of the existing development. Stone gables, timber cladding and render alongside traditional slate, vertical proportioned windows and traditional features are all present in the proposed house type design. Pitched roof dormers, front entrance porches and stone chimneys are all features retained within the existing development and these elements are replicated in the proposal 
all of these design features and materials are supported by the supplementary guidance for housing in the countryside. The houses have been designed as contemporary reflections of the existing dwellings found at Perclune Mill. All dwellings at Perclune Mill are conversions of existing original and modern agricultural buildings that have evolved and developed over time. The existing dwellings as they are today are quite different to the original buildings, with contemporary extensions being introduced to some properties since the development was completed. Supplementary guidance for housing in the countryside suggests that individual buildings can be of a different scale and mass. In this situation, the proposed house types are the same, but the house type itself presents a varied and interesting front elevation. When the three houses are sited together, there is enough materiality, change in form and depth across the scheme to provide visual interest. There is a precedent set in the area with all new houses to the rear of Bulgreen Courtyard development being the same house type. These houses are prominent within the rural landscape. The new houses proposed at Perclune Mill are not. To summarise, the proposed dwellings are of a similar scale to the existing. They are positioned in an L-shape arrangement around a pond and they reflect the style of the existing conversions. They are tucked against the forest backdrop and do not have a detrimental impact on the wider area. We are not trying to replicate the houses at Perclune Mill, but as explained, we have reflected the key design features and materials that are present within the existing development. The mixture of house types within the existing development is a result of the fact that these are conversions. To conclude, from my understanding, the overall principle of the development appears to be acceptable and the decision to recommend refusal is purely based on design. Design is subjective. As outlined, the proposed design is directly inspired by the existing Perclune Mill development and the house type designs can also be supported by East Ayrshire Council's own guidance for housing in the countryside. Considering this, I ask that committee members look to support the application, which will provide good sized family homes to meet varying and changing needs of householders and allow sufficient space for both living and working within a considered and well designed rural development that will add to improve and enhance Perclune Mill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? No, no, it's not online. Not online. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass to the case of Samari and just to address some of the issues to do with uh, wildlife and also the houses at Val Green, first of all, if that's okay. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Chair. Um, there was um, representation from um, Mrs Donald there that um, asked why the RSPB hadn't been um, consulted and I think I've, I've actually addressed that in the report, but they're not generally consulted uh, for local applications unless it's near the, the special protection area, the special area of conservation, where they have um, an interest in the qualifying interests of those. Um, in terms of light pollution for wildlife, that's also addressed in the report. Um, there may be some issues, but they, we would consider those to be relatively minor. Um, plus the compensatory or mitigatory planting that the, the agent has just been speaking about at Porterson Wood would provide some kind of buffer area um, that would intersect between the main areas of wildlife, especially bats that are light sensitive in terms of their feeding and foraging. Um, so between the application site, there is a new area of woodland proposed within the application. In terms of the um, applications at Bal Green, um, I did some of those and it's, it's a different context. Bal Green was um, redeveloped back in 2000. Four, I think, um, and the firm went bust in 2008, but there were some new houses built at the back as part of the enabling development to restore the, the steading um, and the various outbuildings and so on. Um, so there are some larger two-storey houses at the back of Balgreen. Um, the steading's now been refurbished and the houses are all occupied. Um, Balgreen sits off the uh, Dirimpole Road, or oh, sorry, the road down to Skeldon, um, and it's it's a steading that you have to either go through in the old days or go round about now to get to the new bills. So it's a different concept um, of arrangement of former um, farm buildings, and it's quite distant from the public road as well. 
Um, and it's all within the footprint of the old stead and lands, if you like. Um, any questions? Happy to answer those from members, Chair. Can I ask Marion and Barry, are the biggest implications for this, the design of the houses, as I suggested, not the fact that they're being put onto agricultural land? Yes, that, that's right, Councillor Freel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, just add to that. Um, as we said, the uh, Perclou Mill is identified. We would identify Perclou Mill as a cluster. Um, so, in principle, um, adding on to that, you know, with an appropriate siting and design of houses is, is acceptable. But the the issue in this case is the siting and design, which we think is is unacceptable for the reasons that we've given. But that could be conditioned otherwise. Then. We wouldn't be able to condition yeah, the siting and design. I mean, that's that's really sort of, you know, that that's fundamental to the application. So we certainly wouldn't be able to condition that. Obviously. Yeah, thanks, convener. Yeah, thanks, guys. And again, I need some advice, uh, uh, legal aspects, as well as planning. Um, Page 46, uh, paragraph 58, and I am surmising, I may be wrong, I'm surmising that uh, I think it was 2009 uh, was discussed when the Perclude Mill development was uh, built about that time. Uh, would there have been conditions laid down from planners or the planning committee about this discussion? And I do accept that it might be a private legal matter and not within the scope. But at the time at the planning committee, if there was a condition laid down that this field was uh, part of the development to be used by the people that buy the houses and the, the new development, that there was a condition that it wasn't to be built upon, it was to be used as amenity land. Um, I just wondered about that part. Thanks. Um, I'm, we're certainly not aware of any um, sort of allocation of that land for amenity land. It would be unusual for uh, that type of development at the time for to for us to sort of condition or um, is require that area to be used as that. So, yeah, there's nothing, there's no reason why we think that that site would be allocated for that. I'll try, I'll try. Okay. Going to bring in legal at this point, okay? Through you, Chair. Um, in terms of paragraph 58 on page 46, clearly that relates to the original agreement um, that was entered into between uh, the farmer and the, the developer. So the, the reference there to conditions um, would, my assumption would be relating to the conditions of sale of the land rather than planning conditions. And obviously, um, the original conditions in terms of the sale of land would be based upon commercial interests at that time. Um, as we know that there are, um, depending upon whether that was transferred through into you know, the title document when the, the, the lands were um, sold, um, ultimately, as we know, title conditions can be varied or removed and there are certain options available. What we have here is clearly an application for planning permission in relation to those three properties. And uh, what this would come down to would be commer a commercial, the commercial interests um, of the owner of that land. Um, and if that is the developer, then it would effectively be, um, you know, uh, a commercial matter for them. Uh, planning permission, you know, uh, wouldn't be precluded from being sought. Um, the issue would be whether or not the development could uh, still proceed given any title conditions um, that there may be. Um, the example, as members are, are aware, that I often give is you can apply for planning permission to build a, a house in the car park here at Linden Road. You may not own the land, but it doesn't prevent you applying for planning permission. Similar here, where we'll get title conditions, it wouldn't preclude somebody making the application. The, ultimately, it would be a question for the developer or uh, you know, whether or not in a commercial business sense um, they were able to build, bring that forward in an appropriate way at the appropriate time. Happy with that, Provis. 
Um, is there anything else the uh, planning officers wish to add before we um, close the procedures? I could just go through some of the other points that were raised just uh, just uh, with the representations there. Um, just with, with regard to road safety, um, we if there's an existing situation or, or problem with traffic using the road, that isn't an issue for this application. It's obviously whether it's um, adding additional vehicles onto the road that might cause a problem, but we don't have a, an objection from ERE about that. Um, we know that there isn't public transport and it, yeah, there will be a reliance on car usage, uh, but we do have a policy which allows for development within clusters. So in principle, we, we can accept additional housing within these areas, um, even if there isn't public transport links. Um, with regard to the size of the site, and I think there was sort of a point raised about sort of potential future housing, but that would obviously be considered in its own merits. Um, and in the future LDP2, we will be looking to identify clusters so that this cluster may or may not be identified, but that will go through a consultation process and so on. So that's not too much of an issue. Um, we would obviously sort of agree um, mostly with what the objectors are saying about the design and um, the sort of lack of respect to the design of the, the uh, Perclure Mill development. Um, although, the, um, as the agent has pointed out, the frontages may be of a similar length to the frontages of some of the houses at the mill development, it's quite a different context to the site, um, particularly with the upward sloping gradient of the site. Um, the houses are also, um, have, a, have quite a large footprint as well. So as a result of building on that gradient, there will need to be levels changes and um, cut and fill and so on. So that also affects how, how it will look. Um, and it is quite an exposed site as well. Um, there isn't too much more to add, I don't think, from what's already been said. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Provost, I just checked the back office there and there was no conditions on the, the Perclune Mill development for that land. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, everyone. That is the end of the hearing procedure now. OK, just give us one second. OK, members, is there any points of clarification you'd like? Any questions, any comments you'd like to make? Mm. Councillor Todd, Provost. Thanks, Convener. Um, just uh, one thing is, uh, jumping out at me as if uh, development does go ahead. It's um, that by any intrusion, uh, you might be upsetting the, the natural drainage of an area and um, show that if it did go ahead, the conditions would be that that drainage would be uh, to the satisfaction of ARA and uh, uh, Scottish Water. So I'd imagine that. But at the moment, I'm, I'm leaning towards maybe a site visit because um, while the photographs were okay, I, I would I would like to see the visual impact of the existing houses as opposed to what the, the other houses would be like. Uh, I'm, that, personally, that's what I, I, I'm thinking at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Um, there was one question I'd like raised, um, and it's the red line area on the map, if we can explain why part only part perhaps of it is being used as opposed to all of it. Thank you. And, and there was one more question after that um, about how the, the height of the buildings and the height of the gradient and how, could they be obscured with planting? Thank you. Sorry, could you just clarify your question about the, the red line site? Just sorry. Yes, the red line site, there seems to be they're only partly using the red line site and putting the houses together. So I was just interested. Thank you. Um, the application description, I think, was for the change of use of that land to domestic and recreation ground. But um seems 
oh, we don't really, we wouldn't really want that area to be used for garden ground, basically, um, if that's what the proposal is. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a very large site, and if you have, if, if that becomes part of the cartilage of any of the houses or all of the houses, then there are permitted development rights then that they have and to be able to build sheds and buildings, and it becomes basically a garden rather than a field, um, an extremely large area. <laughs> so um, it just seems very unnecessary, and it's not completely clear why that was done that way. So we would be looking to restrict the area to restrict the area that's used for garden ground or cartilage to the dashed line that's on the, that's around the plots um, and the visual impact as well I think you said if uh, if can it be screened um, probably not no um, unless you were to put up a very high fence which would obviously be extremely <laughs> visually um, obtrusive as well so no Thank you. Members, any further questions? Okay. Councillor Barton? Yeah, it's not a question. I think I've got enough information to... I've got to move that we agree with the, the planning, planning officer's decision. It's contrary to policy 14 MP4, contrary to policy 29 MP4, contrary to policy res 1 LDP, and contrary to policy OP1. And it's contrary to the uh, supplementary design guidance. How's the country say? Thank you, Councillor Barton. So we have a proposal. Councillor Filson, I'm assuming you have something to say on this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd just like to uh, second that. Uh, as a local member, I know the, the, the area really well. Uh, I just feel this application would take everything away from the, the local Pacoon Mill setting itself. I've, I've travelled up and down that road a few times uh, over the years, and as Melissa had alluded to earlier on there, there's, there's no passing paces whatsoever. So it's a case of having to reverse. So I have another three houses in there with potential another six cars. I think that would be a real, real problem. So I'm going to second for refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. So is anyone otherwise minded? Nope. So we're in agreement. Okay, thank you. So as then, um, who was that? No, no, David. Apologies, be, Maureen. Sorry, no, but just to say yes in agreement. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, so it looks like we are unanimous. We're going to accept the recommendations and refuse the application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been approved, has been refused. Sorry for the reasons detailed in the report. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thank you very much for your participation this morning. And you're also welcome to stay for the rest of the planning committee if you wish. OK, everybody. I'll just give people a minute to leave the chambers. Okay, that's the chambers cleared, everyone. We're going on to agenda item number five, planning application number two to oblique zero 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 one oblique S thirty six, and it's application application for section thirty six content for Lathan's Wind Farm Extension at Lathan's U seven one six Craig Shale from C forty seven Mansfield Road to Corson Conhill, and apologies for my last region pronunciation of everything around here. One's been teaching me. Thank you. <laughs> so, agenda on term number. Thank you. Graham. Graham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, it's still morning. Uh, this I'll just this will just be a brief overview of everything. Obviously, the detail is in the application report. Uh, the council received a consultation request from the Scottish Government for an application made under Section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the proposed Lethens Extension Wind Farm, as the generating uh, capacity is in, in is in excess of 50 megawatts. Uh, the council, as a formal consultee in this process, requires to provide a response to the Scottish ministers to the consultation, and can either offer no object offer no objection to the Section 36 application as submitted offer no objection subject to the imposition of appropriate conditions 
and or legal obligations it considers necessary to make the development acceptable or object to the application stating the grounds on which the objection is made. Uh, the slide on the screen now uh, shows the application site boundary for the proposed extension. Uh, the site is located to the northeast of Newcomnock and borders neighbouring Dumfries and Galloway Council. As some background and context, you can see on the current slide that the Lethlands extension uh, site boundary is outlined in red. The blue outline is land under the same ownership as the applicant and coincides with the site boundary of the existing Lethlands wind farm, which has been consented previously by the Scottish ministers. The Lethlands wind farm section 36 was consented on the 18th of June 2020 and included 22 turbines of varying height seven of which have a maximum height of 176 metres, 10 turbines with a maximum height of 200 metres and five turbines with a maximum height of 220 metres. Uh, the current consented Lethens wind farm has not yet been built. The applicant is currently proposing an extension to the consented wind farm with the extension site being located to the northeast of the original Lethens wind farm site, as you can see on the slide. Although the applicant has applied for this as an extension to the consented wind farm, they have also applied for an access track leading from Mansfield Road into the extension area, which follows much of the same route as the access track for the consented Lethens wind farm. This is to enable the applicant to access and construct the proposed Lethens extension wind farm and operate it as a standalone wind farm should the consented Lethens wind farm not be built. So just to clarify this point, the proposal under, considera under consideration today is intended to be an extension to the consented wind farm, but could equally be constructed and operated on its own as a wind farm without the previous consented wind farm being built. This slide uh, shows the proposed site layout of the Lethens Extension Wind Farm. Key infrastructure proposed includes 10 wind turbines, seven of which would have a maximum height of 251 metres, and three turbines would have a maximum height of 235 metres, all of which would have a maximum rotor diameter of 170 metres. Uh, associated turbine foundations and crane hard standings would be formed, access tracks, including the access track from Mansfield Road through the consented Lethens Wind Farm site, uh, watercourse crossings, up to four temporary borrow pits, a permanent uh, meteorological mast of up to 150 metres in height, temporary construction compound and underground cabling. The proposed extension would have a generating capacity of approximately 60 megawatts and the construction period would take approximately two years with a 30 year operational lifetime and thereafter decommissioning and site restoration. The Council has consulted a number of consultees whilst the Scottish ministers have consulted more widely as they are the ones who will be determining the application. Of the consultees contacted by the Council, none have raised any objections to the proposed development, although this is subject to conditions in many cases. The consultation undertaken by the Scottish Government has resulted in a number of responses from various organisations, most of whom do not object to the application, often subject to conditions. Uh, Glasgow Airport and NATS object due to aviation safety impacts. Discussions are currently ongoing between the aviation bodies and the applicant, with a view to agreeing potential mitigation. As the Scottish ministers will be determining the application, it will ultimately be for them to consider this matter when reaching any decision on the application. A review of the Scottish Government Energy Consents Unit website indicates there were five representations received by the Scottish ministers in respect of the application, all in support of the, of the development, generally due to potential economic benefits and the contribution the wind farm would make towards re renewable energy gen generation targets. There now follows a series of slides showing photo montages and wirelines from a select number of viewpoints to provide a sense of some of the landscape and visual impacts likely throughout the area. Some of the photo montages have been scaled to fit the height of the slide, as when viewing photo montages on a monitor, they should be enlarged to fit the full screen height to more accurately reflect the scale of the turbines in the view. The slides are all taken from the environmental information and are used for context only in this presentation with the detailed environmental information available to view as background papers. Yeah, so this is the this is a view from viewpoint 19 representing the southern extents of Newcomnock, approximately 10 kilometres from the nearest turbine. 
on the top row you have the baseline photograph and below that you have the cumulative wireline showing the proposed turbines in red with other consented schemes shown in blue which includes the consented lethans and neighbouring Glen Mucklock and Dumfries and Galloway. This slide is the wireline of the proposed extension turbines from the same location to the south and to the southern limits of New Cumnock, with only the proposed turbines shown in the view. And this is a photo montage from New Cumnock showing the representative view of the turbines from this location. And <coughs> it's only the proposed turbines that are shown in that photo montage. Uh, this slide is a cumulative wireline from viewpoint 5, which is Kyle Castle's scheduled monument, approximately six kilometres from the nearest turbine. Here you can see that the proposed extension, although adding to the spread of turbines from this view, represents a relatively limited addition compared to the consented lessons and Glen Mucklock sites, and cumulatively or in isolation would not lead to an unacceptable impact from this location. This is the baseline photograph on the top row and the cumulative wireline beneath that from viewpoint 14, which is the summit of Cairn Table Hill, approximately five kilometres from the nearest turbine. You can see from here that there are con a considerable number of turbines which have either been consented or built um, and proposed here, um, which all, all would be viewed from the summit. This is a cumulative photo montage where the applicant has included the proposed Lethens extension turbines in the view alongside the consented Lethens wind farm and Glen Mucklock wind farm turbines in that view. Of course, neither of those, those two sites have been built yet. And this slide here just shows the photo montage of the proposed extension turbines in isolation without either consented Lethens or Glen Mucklock schemes digitally added either. And this is again the baseline view along the top and the cumulative wireline beneath that from viewpoint 20, which is at Muirkirk, Muirkirk approximately 8.7 kilometres north of the nearest turbine. And again, this is just the photo montage from Muirkirk with the proposed turbines digitally introduced, which you can see just in approximately the centre of the screen there. In terms of the assessment of impacts of the proposed development, Landscape and visual impacts are the most obvious and apparent impacts associated with wind farms. As the slides have demonstrated, there will be varying impacts from different locations and distances from the proposed turbines. However, it has been assessed that cumulative landscape and visual impacts and impacts associated with the proposed Lethens extension in isolation without you know, the consented Lethens wind farm proceeding would not be unacceptably adverse. Nighttime lighting impacts would be similarly would similarly not be unacceptable, subject to shielding and intensity reduction mitigation being implemented. Noise from wind farm can be controlled by suitable limits, which the Council's noise consultants ACON have advised on, and which can be discussed with the Scottish Government Energy Consents Unit, should ministers be minded to approve the development. Other impacts cover a range of issues such as ecology, ornithology, forestry, hydrology, traffic peatland and the whole historic environment, amongst others. Most impacts are capable of being addressed by appropriate mitigation, subject to being secured by conditions. In terms of policy three of NPF4 and the requirement for significant biodiversity enhancement, there is a question mark at the current time over the extent to which the current proposals would comprise significant biodiversity enhancement or simply mitigation of impacts of the development. It will be for Scottish ministers to determine whether the applicant's proposals go far enough to qualify as significant biodiversity enhancement or whether more is needed. Although if more is needed, it is likely that conditions would provide a suitable mechanism for securing further habitat enhancements over and above those currently proposed to achieve the aim of delivering that significant biodiversity enhancement. In terms of financial implications, the applicant has so far not provided any decommissioning report so we've not been able to start negotiations on the quantum of any financial guarantee uh, for the decommissioning, restoration and aftercare of the site uh, should consent ultimately be granted. However, the applicant has agreed to enter into a Section 75 legal agreement to provide a financial guarantee and the Council would expect negotiations on the quantum of that to continue as the Scottish Ministers consider the application. In terms of other potential financial implications, should the 
planning committee be minded to object to the proposed development contrary to the recommendation of the chief governance officer this will trigger a public local inquiry and this would result in financial implications including the potential costs incurred in engaging expert external advice support or representation giving evidence on the council's behalf at that inquiry so to conclude the proposed development will result in a number of impacts some of which will be significant particularly in terms of landscape and visual impacts however many impacts are capable of being mitigated and the residual impacts are not considered to be so adverse that they would be unacceptable on that basis it is recommended that the council does not object to the development and informs the scottish ministers in its response that should they be minded to grant uh, consent for the development that the council's position of no objection is subject to the conclusion of the section 75 legal agreement to include those matters detailed within the legal implications section of the report and that the planning authority is to be involved in any discussions with the scottish government and the applicant concerning appropriate planning conditions thank you thank you very much graham um so we're consultees on this we're not looking for proposers or seconders and um, the recommendations are there on page 88 paragraph 2 does anybody have any comments they wish to make councillor todd thanks convener um you know everybody's uh, attention at page 94 and it's paragraph 27 uh, it's just the scottish forestry part um really keen um, to agree with Scottish Forestry about um, reintroducing uh, deciduous trees, um, not just Scots pine, Sitka, spruce and things like that, uh, to give a far more varied wildlife aspect to um, the development. And it would be really good to see, if possible, uh, a plan that the developers agree to and where they would cite those areas of biodiversity um, with a real emphasis on a uh, native uh, hardwood, if, if possible. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly in terms of any replacement planting, we would have conditions, assuming Scottish ministers grant consent, uh, we would have conditions to ensure that we have the details of those um, for our approval. And quite often nowadays um, native planting and, and more uh, diverse planting is proposed and put forward now because I think there is that recognition that you get um, a, a wider environmental benefit and ecological benefit from having more uh, variety in terms of planting. So uh, certainly um, compensatory planting details would come in for us to review. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Prof. That's a, a very good point, very topical at the moment. Planting trees just planting trees isn't any good to us. So um, is that something we'd need to condition, David, or do you think it's already within the report? Thank you. Um, we address forestry generally within the report. Um, there will be compensatory uh, planting required. Um, the Forest and Land Scotland are, or Scottish Forestry are a consultee to ministers anyway, so they'll put forward their position in respect of uh, their most up-to-date guidance. Um, and I would fully expect any consent to have um, conditions about uh, compensatory planting and that would have to reflect whatever the current standards are. Um, we also seek uh, off-site compensatory planting within Ayrshire where possible um, because that ties in with some of our own supplementary guidance. So that's one that we specifically ask ministers to take account of as well. Thank you very much. Very good point there. Um, are we quite happy then with the recommendations? Can we agree? OK, everybody agreed. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda um, is the compliance monitoring update of major developments and environmental projects in East Station. That's pages 165 to 190. Okay, um, Dave is going to come in and then on to Graham. Thank you. Hey, thanks, so Chair. Um, I'm just going to come in first, members, to give you a brief update on the report, and then I'll bring Barry in just to, to deal with the, the more detailed matters. Um, it was just to, to give you a brief um, update in terms of the report. Um, we've slightly changed the format of the report in this quarter. Um, we've slimmed the report down just slightly. We were finding there was a lot of information in it that really wasn't um, adding anything to the compliance update uh, on a kind of quarterly basis. Um, so the report in itself has been slimmed down, just taking out some of the future compliance monitoring sites and so on. They'll be added to the report when those construction sites start commencing so that you, you can then monitor that compliance. But up until that point, it, it's a kind of 
added extra um, that's not really adding to this uh, the purpose of this report. So there's just been a, a, a slight slimming down of the report. Um, the other thing that we have done, um, and it's it's coming ahead of um, a change that, that's coming through legislation, um, the Planning Scotland Act uh, 2019 is going to bring forward um, some changes to the, the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 um, that is going to introduce um, requirements and planning authorities to explain their compliance monitoring of major um, planning applications. So that's major under the, the hierarchy of developments. So it's, it's developments of a certain scale, uh, 20 megawatt plus wind farms and 50 plus houses and that type of thing. Um, we already cover a lot of them in the report um, because we report on wind farms and various other sites that would uh, qualify as uh, major developments. Um, but with this uh, proposed future change in the Act, um, it will actually slightly increase the scope. Now, the Act doesn't require us to bring it in front of you in this quarterly report, but what it does do, it's, it requires us to set out in our enforcement charter um, how we will monitor major uh, development sites and how we will make the findings of that public. So we think that that dovetails quite well with this report. Um, they are large developments, so we've introduced um, a new category. We've folded uh, Appendix 1 and 2 into one um, element now, um, which is a open cast and the restoration of such, um, because that's it's more focused on restoration. And we've brought major developments within um, Appendix 2. Uh, that it basically gets us ahead of the legislation. We think we comply with the legislation um, on that basis. Um, and we're as well bringing it in now. We have this quarterly report. I know that members have general interest in a lot of these sites anyway. Um, one of the, the slight differences, um, just to make you aware at this stage, and we have set this out um, in paragraphs 9 to 11 um, of the compliance report, um, we're not proposing at this stage to formally compliant uh, monitor each of these major development sites in terms of being out there on a, a regular basis to every single one of them. We have a limited resource that we need to target. Um, so our proposals for these at the moment are if there are complaints or a matter that comes to your attention, our enforcement officers go out and investigate that, as they always would have done. And we'll report that into to this report um, so that you're aware of the general compliance nature um, of these sites. That builds a bigger picture, and if we see frequent non-compliance from sites, we can obviously look to change the compliance monitoring regime and target some resources at sites that are particularly bad um, or non-compliant, um, and that will start to, to bring it perhaps more frequently um, and a more detailed compliance monitoring regime. Ultimately, developers are supposed to um, build in accordance with their plans and the, the documents that they have submitted um, and the planning conditions. So that's the starting point. They should be compliant um, and we generally would take that to be the right position and we'll intervene as and when necessary. So as members, you'll occasionally get complaints, I'm sure, from your constituents and you then pass that on to ourselves um, and our enforcement officers investigate that. So that process is, is being brought within this compliance monitoring report. So it's just a slightly different take on how we do the monitoring and we're targeting our resources as best we can. But as I said, if, if we have particularly difficult or non-compliant sites that are frequently coming to our attention, um, we can start to introduce a more formal compliance aspect to them. Um, but it was just to make you aware that that's a change that we brought in slightly earlier um, than what the Act requires. But I think we can get ahead of the game and just build that in and, and bring it in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think it was quite comprehensive there. Barry, apologies, you're not different. <laughs> Over to Barry. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so just moving on to some of the content of uh, this month's report. Um, the compliance report provides an update on open cash restoration sites, quarries, landfill, onshore wind farms and electrical infrastructure projects and now all other major development, as already explained. Uh, this report covers a period from 1st of January 2023 to 31st of March 2023. Appendices 1 to 8 provide the detail of the developments and the report provides a summary of the main points. Um, just moving on to some of the some of the issues raised. Um, within open cast coal restoration sites, um, there are no compliance issues to note at any of the sites that are being restored. Um, currently, this is only Greenburn and House of Water. Uh, it is noted that House of Water site clearance is almost complete and is expected that this will conclude by the end of the summer. Um, 
Moving on to major development. So at the moment we have uh, nine major development sites currently under construction. The compliance issues that have been raised are summarised in Appendix 2, and they, those relate mainly to complaints and some uh, relate to non-compliance with conditions relating to the site construction. In most of these cases, we are seeking to resolve these matters and liaison with the developers. However, these will continue to be monitored and more formal action taken if necessary. Um, onshore wind farms, uh, we have currently two wind farms are under construction, Steadon Law and South Kyle. Uh, compliance matters are summarised in Appendix 3. Compliance at South Kyle is noted as being generally acceptable. Uh, some issues relate to the restoration of temporary infrastructure areas and the construction of forest tracks and crossings which require planning permission. Similarly, at Steadon Law, it's noted as generally being compliant. But the main issue has been the discharge of mud onto the A719. Uh, this has been raised with the developer and measures have been put into place to alleviate the problem, which will be monitored over the coming months. Uh, the quarries within the area generally operate in compliance with their respective planning permissions. The main issue currently is at Garpel Quarry, where a habitat management plan review, which is required as part of the Section 75 agreement, is overdue. We understand, however, that the operator is currently liaising with Nature Scott and RSPB regarding this, and we'll, this will be monitored to ensure that it's progressed. Uh, I'll just move on to just a few photographs. There aren't too many, um, just to uh, show some of the sites. Right. So this is a Balakh Mayo development um, in Appendix 2. It's noted that there have been complaints about the completion of the Suds Pond uh, at uh, this development. The developer, this is the Suds Pond area here, uh, the developer has stated that uh, the necessary works will be completed during this summer. Uh, also in Appendix 2, there have been complaints about grading of soil mounds and associated drainage arrangements within uh, this area of open space, which is between the existing housing estate and uh, rig road development, which is currently under construction. Um, at this point, it's not considered that enforcement action is required uh, uh, and the area will be monitored to ensure that uh, no further issues arise. It's just a few more photos of it. Uh, and this slide here shows uh, one of the forestry access tracks at South Kyle, which is uh, unauthorised and requires planning permission. Um, so to conclude, just on the report, the recommendation is that members note the content of the report and note that no formal enforcement action has been taken or is warranted at any of the sites that are uh, being monitored. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And I think the photographs were very helpful there towards the end. Um, Councillor Pilson. Thanks, Chair. Just looked for a couple of e e updates. Uh, page 168 there, uh, paragraph 18, uh, the Mothball and Agalaf landfill site. Can you update us what's actually happening there? Uh, and paragraph 20 there, the Chamberson Opencast site. Uh, I suppose this, or this the restoration will probably have to wait until the North Kyle wind farm is, is uh, built. Uh, are they in talks with the uh, Hargreaves just now how the, they're going to restore the site itself? Uh, sorry, firstly, just a uh, Garlaf um, bar or the operators of that site, but aren't currently operating it. So it's been um, just not doing anything at the moment. Um, so that's really all that's going on with it. Um, there isn't any compliance as such taking place there uh, because there isn't anything happening. Uh, but we do know that SEPA have been out to the site to check uh, for their side of things. Um, so that, that's all we know about that site at the moment. Uh, Charleston, um, there is the areas that are within the forestry land, Scotland land, which the council undertook some safety works in um, about a year or so ago. Um, that area is where the North Kyle wind farm will be developed. Um, and I understand that's going to kick off probably in the next couple of months, perhaps. Um, so we do have another uh, or further more significant restoration works planned in that area. But at the moment, although we can plan to a certain extent, we're also sort of at the uh, 
we need to see what happens with the wind farm, first of all, just to see how that develops. And then go in once the wind farm's away, because we can't really do these works at the same time as the wind farm is being constructed. So there will be a bit of a delay uh, or, or, you know, it'll be another couple of years probably until work starts there. Um, the Hargreaves site is obviously it was the sort of private area that was owned by Hargreaves um, and they have restored that site to our satisfaction. Um, but we don't know what their plans are with it um, now, if they intend to sell it or use it for some other purpose. So that's all I can say at this moment. That's great. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Barry. If there's no more questions, the recommendations and they are for noting only are on page 165. We agree to note. Thank you. OK, on to the last piece of business for today, agenda item number seven. Should we and it's the update report on progress of planning applications which have been recommended for approval, which are subject to the conclusion of an appropriate legal agreement and or are le legacy planning applications in East Ayrshire, beginning in pages 191. Thank you, David. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this report is the quarterly report on progress with applications subject to a legal agreement and legacy planning applications. And um, the report covers the period January to March 2023. Um, in terms of this reporting quarter, paragraphs 10 and 11 and appendix table 1 show that there are six applications awaiting conclusion of legal agreement. Uh, that's one more than the last quarter. Um, no applications have stalled um, and a number are nearing conclusion to allow issue of the decision notice um, in the, the foreseeable future. Um, in respect of legacy applications, uh, paragraphs 12 and 13 and appendix table 2 show that there are 18 legacy applications. Um, that's one more than the last reporting quarter um, and six legacy applications were cleared within the quarter. Uh, many of these applications uh, are under processing agreements, uh, which project manages the application to revise timescales um, that are suitable to the council and the applicant. Um, currently, no application has stalled um, and there is no requirement to return any applications to either planning committee or the appointed officer for reconsideration. Um, members are therefore asked to note the content of the report and the actions in each application set out in tables, which is essentially to allow continued progress on each legacy and legal agreement application. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, members? No, nothing online as well. Thank you, David. So recommendations are on page one nine one, and it's three for noting. Okay, oh, that's a thousand, Drew. Beg your pardon, Drew. Sorry, Chair. Just a wee one at the back there, the very last page. Miko Hill substation, uh, where they're doing the the works here just now. Uh, could the planners tell us just actually what they're doing there in the left hand side? They seem to have cleared a fair area. Uh, of the peat and they're putting down some hard standing. Could they actually tell us just what's, what actually they're doing there? Liam, let's come in. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Counts and Councillor Felson. Um, uh, the works for the substation haven't actually started yet. The um, extension application is still being uh, considered likely to be issued soon. Um, I think I believe the works on the left hand side of the B simple yes. one. Yeah, that's associated with some, um, if you like, uh, preparatory works um, for North Kyle uh, Wind Farm. It's for to do with this substation, I believe. Um, but that's it's it's not a sort of commencement, if you like, of North Kyle. Right, that's um, great. Just, yeah, but it's, it's not to do with the substation itself. Right, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Felson. I can maybe just add a wee touch to that, just um, in terms of uh, what Graham's talking there about the substation for North Kyle. North Kyle hasn't formally commenced development, um, but the developer did approaches about um, doing some preparatory work um, in that area um, so that they have a chance of achieving their grid connections and so on later. Um, there's a, a commercial um, aspect to it for them. Um, so they've liaised with us and we've taken the view that they can commence works, um, albeit it doesn't commence the consent um, at their own risk. And we're not taking any enforcement action on that basis because there are permissions in place. They are actively talking to us. They are actively discharging their conditions um, as a, a particular circumstance that, that faces that development. And they've been open and honest with us about it um, and also fully accept that um, if they are unable to progress with their consent, that the onus is in them to restore anything that they do do. So it's 
it's a degree of work that that we've allowed to take place without uh, taking any enforcement action on it. Um, but that's that's been um, worked through with the developer, um, and uh, the information on that is also publicly available on our portal. So it's not hidden in any way. Um, it is slightly unusual, um, but it's it's not completely unique. We have allowed this kind of situation before, and it's it's quite a a limited scope of works considering the size of the consent that they actually hold. Thanks very much for that, David. That's great. Thank you. Yep, thanks, David. That's a really good explanation. If there's no more further questions, that is, we can go to recommendations for noting. All noted. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, today. That was a complete and full house for all councillors. Well done. Thank you. And have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Thanks, Maureen.